Our scripture lesson this morning is from Acts 2. We will read it together. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Fellow Jews, that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourself from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. How's everybody this morning? Oh, and we even have Bibles. How cool is that? So we just listened to a scripture written uh, from the book of Acts, and it had some words in it, and I wondered whether you knew what it meant. What does it mean to repent? (coughs) Repent. Every once in a while you see... I don't know that I've ever seen this. I've only ever seen pictures of this, of somebody standing on a street corner with a sign that says, repent. Any idea? It literally means to change direction. Like you're walking one way, and you realize you're walking in the wrong wrong direction, and you decide to go in a different direction. So in terms of faith, like say... God is back there, and you're walking this way, and you see somebody on the side of the road with a big sign that says, repent, and it makes you think, huh, maybe I should go back in that direction towards God. Because we can make decisions that draw us closer to God or decisions that pull us farther away. Does that make sense? Gosh, I lost you really quickly this morning. All right, so there's a story in the Bible about it, it, uh, prodigal son. I'm bringing in another story from Bible where this young man said to his father, um, I know you're not dead yet, but I want the money that I'm going to get when you die. What do you, how do you think the father reacted to that? Doesn't really doesn't really say in scripture, but you can imagine him being really hurt, right? So you want to act like I'm dead? Okay. So he gave the son the money. And so that's kind of like going away from God. Right? And then he went off, did his own thing, lost all the money, and he's uh having to work in a job that he never in a million years thought he would have to do. And he was sleeping with the pigs, right? He was, you know, he was feeding the pigs. Or, and he was like, I don't even get to eat what they're eating. Doesn't sound so good, I hear some of one of the adults say, right? Like, what's the worst job? There used to be a show on television called Dirty Jobs, right? Right? So he was having to do the thing that he never in a million years would have chosen to do or wanted to do. And then he thought, what the heck am I doing? I should go back to my father's house and say, hey, treat me like a servant. You know, give me a job here. It's going to be better than what I'm doing, right? So he goes back. And the father sees him coming on the road. And what do you think he does? Have you heard this story? Okay, what do you think he does? He doesn't help him? We would understand that if he didn't, right? We would understand, like, huh, who are you? I don't remember, right? We could understand that. Any other guesses? That's not what happened. 
he ran to him with open arms and embraced him and said, my son has come home, right? That's love. That's forgiveness, right? So in the scripture lesson that we just read, it says these people hear this message about Jesus and they're like, what do we do with it? What do we do with, you know, what do we do with this now? And they were told, repent and be baptized. Repent means turn towards God. Instead of making decisions in your life that pull you away from God, make decisions that draw you closer to God. And the be baptized piece of it, um, when we have baptisms, we are reminded that nothing that we have done I've totally lost them. I hope you're enjoying this. Um, nothing that we have done, nothing that we have left undone, nothing that has been done to us can make God stop loving us. That's what we're reminded of at baptism. God loves us no matter what. We are forgiven, and God just wants to live in re- relationship with us. All right, so I want you to pretend, arms wide. Can you do this, Alexa? Eliana, Teresa, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I got it right off the bat. Give yourself a big hug. God loves you no matter what. Okay? God loves you no matter what. And now let's fold our hands, close our eyes, bow our heads, and say a prayer together. Gracious God, thank you for calling us home, for reminding us that we're loved. And Lord, continue to have people Maybe not on the on, on a street corner with the word repent, but with a reminder that there's nothing that that we can do that will stop you from loving us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And our second scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. This is the story of the walk to Emmaus. Now, on that same day. This is the day of resurrection. Two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They, went at the, they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Hope is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Emily Dickinson. The only part of that poem that I, that I know by heart is hope is a thing with feathers. Cleopas and Fran told the stranger on the road to Emmaus, we had hoped that he would redeem Israel, or the Greek literally ransom Israel. Other manuscripts read that he would free Israel, but I want to focus on we had hoped. I've been watching Ted Lasso. It's on Apple, and it's great, and I know you have to pay a subscription for it. So season three, this is the last season, it's, then it's going to be done. So when it's all done, rent Apple for one month, watch the whole series. It's wonderful. And there's this one episode where uh, Ted, Ted is uh, from Kansas, and he's an American football coach and he goes over to he's hired to coach a premier league soccer uh, you know they would say football uh, soccer team over in in England he doesn't know the game but he knows people and he has these inspiring speeches so he takes on an uh, an axiom a phrase a turn a, a turn of phrase in England so he says so I've been hearing this phrase y'all got over here that I ain't too crazy about it's the hope that kills you. Y'all know that? I disagree, you know? I think it's the lack of hope that comes and gets you. See, I believe in hope. I believe in belief. Now, where I'm from, we got a saying too, yeah? Very Ted Lasso. A question, actually. Do you believe in miracles? Now, I don't, y'all, I don't need y'all to answer that question for me, but I do want you to answer the question for yourselves right now. Do you believe in miracles? And if you do, I want y'all to circle up with me right now. Come on, let's go. You know, and then they all get in the middle. Richmond on three, one, two, three. You know, that. What is your relationship with hope? If I'm being honest, I probably navigate the world trying not to get my hopes up for fear of disappointment. It's like when somebody tells you, or multiple people tell you, oh, that movie is so great, you got to see it. And then you go in expecting it to be awesome, and you're disappointed because everybody's built it up. So better to go in with low expectations, right? They had hoped that Jesus was going to redeem Israel. If we have no hope, we stay home. We don't work for change. We don't work for the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. There's a price to pay if we don't have hope. The earth will pay for it. The human race will pay for it. It's a costly thing not to have hope. Recently, I've been praying for miracles in the lives of loved ones. And my prayers tend to go like this. Lord, I don't know how it works. I know that through your spirit, people are healed. I also know that you work through medicine and therapy. But however you want to orchestrate it, Lord, I pray for healing in this person. And sometimes the healing comes as a miracle. There was a tumor and now it's gone. And sometimes the gift is more time. And sometimes it's tragic. And our faith is shook. And we struggle to hold on to hope. But we are called to live as those with hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. To believe in God is to live in hope. For Jesus was resurrected from the dead, and we are an Easter people. 
where there was here, where there was a period, two more dots were added, and it's now an ellipses. Death is not the end of the story. Another way of saying that is there is a way out of no way. When Jesus resurrected, he showed himself to the disciples in different ways, depending on the gospel. Here in Luke, he appears to two people walking on the road, Cleopas and someone else. Uh, some scholars make an argument that's, that it could very well be a woman. But I would underscore that he appeared to ordinary folk, not famous, named and unnamed, could have been you or me. And they don't recognize him. There's part of me that thinks, you know, uh, well, we know that they, we know that they were part of the group, but there was like the inner circle, and uh, I was thinking of them as like part of the crowd, like they not so close enough as to to recognize him, but they've listened to him, so there's some distance, but yet they hear him in the same way that when we read scripture, we don't get. There's some distance, and yet we can still hear his voice. So again, like you and me. But Jesus walks with them, interprets scripture, and they listen. One commentary I read noted that it wasn't scripture that opened their eyes. (laughs) It was the breaking of the bread. An ordinary thing, breaking bread together. In Acts 2, verse 42, we read that the early disciples And the converts devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And many were added to their number, we are told. We put so much emphasis on worship, but I wonder if the emphasis shouldn't be on gathering around tables and breaking bread together, praying for each other, and and maybe doing some Bible study and devotions, or, or sharing our stories, because that's what the apostles' teaching was, them sharing their stories, sharing the teachings of Jesus as they had experienced it. What if we sat and shared our stories of God, the living God, our stories from today? In this story, in this biblical story, we see how God shows up in the ordinary. Now, God can show up however God wants to show up, but on that day, and it, and it is our faith tradition to affirm, God has to show up for the miracle to happen. The miracle of faith. We just set the table. Jesus was going to walk on, but the hospitality of the two disciples, Cleopas and friends, took over and they invited him to stay and sit at a table with them and their eyes were opened. Did our hearts not burn while he was talking with us? When I was in seminary a few years ago, an evangelical group of students would invite people to come and share their story and how they came to faith. And very often, this group of students were looking for a day, an hour, a minute when it happened. And their eyes were open and and folks came to believe in Jesus. And I was grateful when the president of the seminary was invited to come and share. And he says, I, I don't have that date or time to share with you. I grew up in the church. I've just kind of always believed. And when you talk to pastors about their, their call stories, there's the folks who have the lightning bolt moment. And then there's the folks who just have this gradual sense of knowing. And then at one moment, just realizing, ah, I'm supposed to do this. And it's not going to let me go. I wonder if if coming to faith for some isn't like the surprise of, you know, when you find yourself singing to yourself and you realize, oh, I'm happy. Or realizing, I believe. There's no formula for coming to faith. Post-Easter, we see Jesus open people's eyes in different ways. For Mary, it was having, hearing her name being spoken by Jesus. For Thomas, I'm calling him, after Mel's sermon last week, I'm calling him the engineer of the disciples. It was seeing, touching, confirming for himself. You know, for today we might say it wasn't his, not his grandmother's faith, not his father's faith, but his own faith. And here we have ordinary folks sitting around a table and the bread is broken and suddenly 
they believe. God is amazing and is not wor- and is worthy not only of our belief but also our hope. We had hoped he would redeem Israel. God has hoped that we would work for the kingdom of God in every age. So they had hoped God would do it. God is hoping that we're going to do it, live into it. Hopeful people show up, praying to God, but stepping out in faith and working for change. They show hospitality to the stranger who they find walking the path with them. They participate in cleanup days for Earth Day. I was so excited yesterday. I had a scheduled date with my husband. We went down to uh, Holland Ridge Farms, which is that big tulip farm down in, I think it's Cream Ridge. Oh, my gosh, it's gorgeous. I hope they survived the rain, Uh, but it was beautiful. But when I came home, I saw pictures online of folks from this church cleaning up Clark's Pond behind the middle school in Bloomfield, and I was so excited about it. I shared it on my, on my timeline. I'm like, this is my church. Folks stepping out in faith, showing up. And today, Friends of Grace are hosting a meal here, breaking bread with folks, learning people's names. God makes extraordinary out, out of the ordinary. I pray that you hear this as a blessing of all that that you are already doing and an encouragement to keep on keeping on. God can take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. And it is also a prayer, Lord Jesus, a recognition that we are so grateful for all the ways that you show up in our small offerings of faith. In Jesus' name, may it be so. Amen.